Hi everybody, it's Dr. A. In our second video uh, on automated analysis, we're going to look at the steps in automated analysis in clinical chemistry. So the first step is going to be specimen preparation and identification. So specimen preparation for chemistry mostly involves centrifugation and then getting the specimen to the analyzer. Uh, it can be automated by robotics um, if you're in a uh, highly automated lab. Uh, we're going to talk about total lab automation towards the end of the video. Or it can be done manually by the lab techs or somebody working in central processing where they're receiving specimens in, they're centrifugating them, and then putting them in racks and then carrying them to the chemistry department and handing them off to the chemistry tech. So um, it, it does include centrifugation, which can be skipped if whole blood is used for analysis. Uh, plasma or serum separator tubes can be used, um, and then if they're used, primary tube sampling uh, can be performed, meaning that there's no need to pull specimen off of the primary tube. It can just be uh, uncapped and loaded straight on the analyzer. And so then, uh, you know, the primary tube sampling on the analyzer will be done with either the heparin plasma or the serum, depending on what the sample was. Uh, and the, the separator tubes are, are the tubes that have the SST. So it's a gel that's at the bottom of the tube. And when you centrifuge the, the tube, then the gel moves between the red cells in the plasma or the serum. Uh, and it allows for the preservation of the specimen in chemistry for longer periods of time and more stability uh, for a lot of analytes. Um, and then the specimen is identified via a barcode label that is affixed to the primary collection tube. That is done by the phlebotomist at bedside right after collection, ideally. And so this barcode should be placed uh, vertically on the tube so that when the tube is loaded on a rack or on an analyzer, the full barcode can be read. It should not be placed horizontally. It should not be placed diagonally. It should not be placed across the top of the tube. Uh, there's so many ways that I've seen um, barcode labels put, but this is the ideal placement of the barcode label for the tubes that are going to be sent to chemistry and for the ones in hematology and coag and all of that too. So next is going to be the specimen measurement and delivery. Uh, so this is um, you know, loading the specimen on the analyzer and then the specimen being sampled and delivered to reaction vessels. So circular carousels or rectangular racks can hold specimen, uh, specimen containers. So uh, that could be the primary tubes that can be um, you know, loaded straight onto the carousels or the racks, or they could have adapters for what we call um, small specimen cups or stuff. So this would be for pediatric samples, or maybe um, if the phlebotomist had a hard time getting a sample from a geriatric patient and they got a low volume, then there are ways to adapt that so that it can be used on the large analyzer. And um, once it's loaded in on the rack and fed into the analyzer, then uh, an aliquot is going to be measured through the aspiration of the sample into a probe, and then it should be dispensed into the reaction vessels or, you know, uh, bits of it dispensed across different reaction vessels. An aliquot is a determined volume, uh, a part of the sample is pulled off, if you will. Um, and um, the probe and the tubing should be cleaned after each dispensing that is done by the analyzer. And this is to minimize carryover unless uh, it's a system that uses disposable probe uh, tips, uh, probes or tips, but something that is one sample and then they dispose of the tip and then pick up a different tip. Then that then you would just have to deal with the tip waste and make sure there's enough tips there um, to feed the analyzer so that the sampling can happen. So um, next is the reagent systems and delivery phase. So reagents can be liquid or dry. Uh, the liquid reagents can be uh, available in bulk volume containers or by unit doses. Um, they can be small, you know, small containers of reagents for a set amount of test. When they are dry, they can be either bottled as a lyophilized powder, then that requires reconstitution. That can be done by the analyzer by adding water to it. If the, it's a wet analyzer that has a, a access to um, purified water, clinical lab reagent water, 
um, or it might have to be reconstituted by the tech that's operating the analyzer. Or um, the more, most common now, I would say, is in the dry is going to be the multi-layer dry chemical, um, dry chemistry slide. So that is used in the vitros line of analyzers. Um, and so they're, you know, dry slides, square, um, and um, they're loaded on the analyzers by stacks uh, of these slide, slides for each type of test. Um, and then once the reagents are loaded on the analyzer, they need to be preserved often by refrigeration. So there are refri refrigeration modules on the analyzer. Uh, if it's a dry tablet or lyophilized um, powder, then it might need to be reconstituted. So, uh, and then it's good for a set amount of time after it's been reconstituted, and it can be done by the analyzer. Uh, and that could be um, adding water or adding um, a reagent that's contained uh, in a vial that is part of the reagent packet. Uh, or it can be a combination of two stable components. So the reagent cartridge has like two blocks and there's reagent A and one block and reagent B and one block and they're stable if they're not mixed. Um, and so uh, a sample of, you know, a certain amount of reagent A is added to the reaction vessel and then a certain amount of reagent B is added to the reaction vessel and then they're mixed and then they make the working reagent that has limited stability. And then the you know, specimen would be added to that. So reagents are often dispensed via tubing from bulk containers or syringes that pipette reagents into the reaction containers or piston-driven pumps that are connected by tubing or pressurized reagent bottles. So there's all different ways of things that the reagents can be uh, dispensed. But uh, the idea is like whatever way uh, or system is used, the reagents need to be able to get to um, into a vessel for reaction and sample added to the reagent. So then we have the chemical reaction phase. So first uh, is going to be mixing the reagents in the sample. Um, and if you look in large analyzers, you will see there are probes that are dealing with the samples and probes that are dealing with the reagents. And so they're adding things to uh, reaction vessels or cuvettes and stuff. And um, there are different ways that um, the reagents and samples can be mixed depending on the system. So in the older continuous flow analyzers, coil tubing can be used to uh, mix them. Um, in the centrifugal analyzers, the rapid start and stop of the rotation of a, 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 the, a rack of a, a carousel, it, it just kind of shimmies and shakes, and that mixes. Um, can use bubbling of air to mix reagents, um, or you can use like mixing paddles. So it has a little paddle that goes in and just whirls and mixes the reagents and the sample. And of course, the paddle is clean between the different reactions. Uh, if there is a need for a separation phase, like in some immunoassays, um, it will use whatever system it has. Uh, could be like something like magnetic beads or whatever, and um, that can help uh, pull the, the parts that need to be analyzed and um, let allow the undesirable substances to be washed from the vessel. Uh, if it requires incubation, which a lot of reactions do, uh, then there, it will go through a heating bath of either water or air around the cuvette. Um, and that will be to maintain the required temperature of the reaction mixture, which is often body temperature or 37 degrees Celsius. Um, anything that uses enzymes in a reaction is going to be very sensitive to temperature, and it's really important for the temperature module to be, um, incubation module to be at the correct temperature. And then the reaction time is going to depend on the rate of transport through the system, the time reagent additions, what else is going on. So the computer on board of these large analyzers times everything so that um, vessels can enter the detection modules in sequence where you get the most efficient use of all the resources and of time. And so the machine times what is going on when things are added and when things are incubated and when things are read. And then the measurement phase. Uh, there are different systems for measurement depending on the type of reaction that is occurring. Uh, we have ion-specific electrodes for a lot of our electrolytes. 
We have visible and ultraviolet light spectrophotometry, which is the most common, and many chemical reactions are read that way. Then we have, uh, in more the immunoassay end of things, we have fluorescence polarization, chemiluminescence, bioluminescence, uh, gamma counters, luminometers, and all that that can be used for measurement. And then lastly, we have signal processing and data handling. So first, accurate calibration is essential to get an accurate information and accurate testing results. Um, multiple instruments that measure the same constituent in the lab should be calibrated so that the results are comparable. So if you run a glucose or a BUN creatinine on machine A or machine B, you should have the same results. Um, automated instruments, once calibrated, do provide long-term stability of the standard curve and require only monitoring. Some instruments are self-calibrating. Um, and advanced automated instruments have a method of reporting the printed results and communicating them to the lab information system, and then which then sends it on to the charts. Um, and so this is where we at currently most in instruments that are used, or especially the large chemistry analyzers, are interfaced with the lab information system, and uh, it it you know the software is such that it talks back and forth and uh, the results are communicated from the analyzer straight to the lab information system. They can be auto-verified and sent straight to the chart, or they can um, have to be uh, looked at by a lab tech so that they can be verified and then sent on into the um, patient's chart. And so computerized monitoring is available for many parameters on that end of things. Uh, and so this can be, uh, you know, for quality control. This can be for a variation in results from within uh, patients. And it just, there's so many things that can be monitored by the computerized uh, systems um, all across everything that's going on on the analyzer and all the data that is being collected and handled and sent to the lab information system. So let's talk briefly about total lab automation. So this is a trend, especially in large reference labs or really large hospitals. So um, the automation part that's been in place for a long time has been the analysis phase. But uh, we've increasingly tried to automate the pre-analytical and post-analytical phase. So the pre-analytical phase uh, that has been automated has to do with sample processing. Obviously, we still need humans to go collect the specimens, but then when they, once they come into the lab, um, it, they actually can be loaded into an automated processor and um, it replaces all the manual handing from central processing. The key components of automation in the pre-analytic phase are gonna be the conveyance system, so something to transport tubes, uh, across uh, the lab to different areas is usually some kind of conveyor belt system where you can see tubes that are moving down a track and going to where they need to go. Uh, you need barcodes um, to, to track the tubes through the systems. And then you need a computer software package to control the specimen movement, to know where to send it, which track to put it on, which analyzer to send it to. And uh, then you need to coordinate the robots uh, with the instruments as work cells. So again, this uh, can be like um, areas within the automation uh, can be work cells. And then um, there's gonna be always automated sorting of the specimen. So you literally could just load all kinds of stuff and it sorts between the tubes that are going to hematology, what's going to chemistry, uh, what may, might be going to coag testing, what might be going to specialized immunoassay chemistry testing, etc. Uh, then everything that needs to be um, is, uh, centrifuge will go to centrifugation uh, if it needs to be uncapped so that it can be loaded on the analyzer, it will be uncapped by the machine, not by a lab tech. Um, and then um, if an aliquot needs to be um, sent, so if it needs to be split between two analyzers, it can uh, pull off part of the specimen and put it into another tube, which then can be automatically barcoded and tracked. And so one specimen becomes two specimens and then they go different directions. And then um, sample archiving after the fact. And so once all the testing has been completed, the sample is returned to a uh, sample storage area 
where um, if you had to retrieve the sample hours later to add some tests to it or to verify something, you can go and search for that specimen in the um, storage end uh, of the system and it can automatically find because the machine knows where it put it so it can go and find it and retrieve it and um, you know maybe add a test to it or whatever and then send it back through the system. The analytical phase of course is what's been automated for a long time so then where is total lab um, automation improving things um, so uh, we are seeing ever smaller micro sampling expanded on board in total test menus we're seeing accelerated reaction times higher resolution optics improved flow through the electrodes enhanced user-friendly interactive software for quality control maintenance and diagnostics because oftentimes you have one person that might be managing three or four different analyzers so it's good that uh, a lot of those parts have become more automated and easier to handle and then they've also done ergonomic and physical design improvements. And then lastly, the post analytic phase or the data management phase of total lab automation. So there is bidirectional communication between the analyzers and the host computer, which the host computer should, uh, it might be a middleware or it might be a lab information system. Uh, and then the integration of workstation managers into the communication system. So uh, if they're managing, you know, the work, a workstation manager, it would be a computer system that's managing multiple analyzers. And then if there's a problem with one, it could alert the tech of what, like, go to this analyzer, there's a problem for them to resolve. Uh, there's going to be automated management of quality control data, because with high volume and lots of automation, you're going to have a lot of data that's being generated. Um, and so some automated management is quite useful on that, where maybe just um, problematic things can be reviewed by a human, everything else can be just filed away. Um, there, um, they can put user-defined perimeters for many values, um, so allowing decisions to be made, cut off values, versus, and also like uh, decision points um, where if it's above this or that, maybe then there's some reflex testing that happens or some flagging. Uh, and um, the total lab automation also um, kind of answered the need for a gap filler between the instrument computer and the lab information system. Again, for handling a lot of this data that's being generated, um, the LIS is just not enough. The LIS is really good to, to grab everything and centralize it in one location and then communicate it with the chart. But then, it, you know, how do you handle quality controlled automations and all the calibrations and all this other stuff that's being generated and then the flow of the specimens through the whole phase uh, of testing. Anyway, so that's uh, a wrap here on my second video on automation. And I will have some more on um, analytic techniques, etc. I do believe immunoassays are going to be what's next. So I will see you there.